Welcome to Business Over Beer, where entrepreneurs, small business owners, and people passionate about what they do bring us their stories and their favorite beer. Hosted by Ben Surratt, Jonathan Kaler, and Jason Canope, it's time to get down to business and drink some beer. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Business Over Beer podcast, the second biggest podcast in the Pacific Northwest, the award-losing podcast that features three of the coolest guys you will ever know, (laughs) me, Ben Surratt, to my right, Jonathan the main man, Kaler. Hello, Jonathan. Good evening, Benjamin. I am the terror of power. Don't the forget terror that. terror of power. Terror of power. You make me sad when you don't get everything right in my introduction. Maybe one of these days. Maybe one. You will give me an introduction fitting to my <laughs> stature. The terror of power. Jesus. And my status as a broadcast What the monster. hell is a terror of power? I don't really know, <laughs> don't to know. be honest. It sounds good. That's all that matters. It does actually sound kind of good, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Terror so, of power. Uh, to my right, as always, is Jason Canope. Jason Canope, how are you guys tonight? Oh, we're done. Are we good? O P P. That's the right. O P P. I I don't have a a power name like Jonathan, but uh, you can just call me Canope. Canoper. <laughs> Canope. That works. At Biz Over Beer. That's right. Com. Oh, you know what I thought of? I thought of the people who are fans of the show. We call them Bobbers. The Bobbers. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of something else, so I don't know. I mean, that uh, could be cool too. Something? Yeah, fishing with your face. <laughs> well, we'll, con- <laughs> we'll we'll continue to workshop that. We have a great guest yeah, with we us. Have a wonderful guest this with week. Us. Uh, we have uh, <laughs> Teresa Nunez of Nunez Photography is joining us. Teresa, welcome to the program. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Mostly because it's beer, so yeah. that's why I'm here. It is. Hey, we'll take it. That's, <laughs> that's right. the draw. We get them that's in the with draw. beer. Hey, come Please. on in. That's how you suck them in. Let's drink beer. Yeah. But yeah. but not to but not to downplay it. You are a business owner. I am a and business an entrepreneur. owner. Somewhat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we'll get into that here uh, in just a little bit. But uh, our program is called Business Over Beer, and so that's where we typically like to start. So you've brought a beer for us today. I have. I brought a f- uh, Lindemann's Frambois. Ooh. Which is one of the first sour beers I've had. Um, it's delicious. It's fermented with this one specifically is fermented with raspberries, so it gives it pretty much just takes on whatever flavor of fruit you put in there. Uh, it goes well with tequila as well as the fernet that I brought. With tequila, talk about the everything fernet. goes well with tequila. What what is that that you brought? Uh, fernet Branca is. Technically, an after dinner, it's an aperitif, so it's good for your digestive tract. Normally, you're supposed to have a little sip after you have dinner. Um, I normally have more than a sip, but <laughs> it's all natural, so it's okay, right? It's, if it's yeah. natural, it's okay. I mean, it's made out of some sort of fruits and so do you r- roots. It it's actually made out of herbs. roots. Do you drink it separately, herbs. or do you drink yeah, yeah. it inside of the beer? Uh, separately. Separately. It's normally like a little, like even you put like a little in there. And yeah. Is it like uh, like a little bitters or something? Or, or something um, like that? It's in the liqueur realm, um, but it's, I mean, it's just in its own. It's like a digestive, which is like its own oh. section. Um, so it's mainly made out of like roots, which so uh, that's why you have it after dinner. It's supposed to help you digest your food and for your digestive tract. I'm sure if you have more than one, it's probably ruining your stomach, <laughs> but you know, trial, <laughs> trial and error. That's what I like to That's say. Really cool. <laughs> All right. Well, let's start with the beer. Yeah. Let's yes. go, ahead, yes. go ahead and open it up. Oh, my goodness. Well, we really are experiencing technical <laughs> difficulties. Uh, we opened the cap. Let me and, take a picture of this. And uh, yeah. there is a cork in the bottle. I forgot, all, I forgot about that part. Oh. So the, uh, well, the hack note. is, I think you got to... I've seen a bunch of YouTubes where you yeah, bang it is, against things is, and something happens. Against? Something happens. The pressure. Oh, of it. There you go. Oh no 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 no! Holy! Oh. I don't know why you would have done that a third time. I didn't think it was gonna come out. What? You could have just pulled it out with your hand. Well, <laughs> you're welcome. 
I'm so oh proud of this. Oh my god. That is awesome. Honestly, so- officer, I smell I like swear. this because the coke. No, you probably only smell hi, like... Hi, 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 you hi, probably, <laughs> I'm wrapping in there. You'll right. smell like uh, uh, Smuckers. Yeah, I mean, it smell. It does. It smells like it smells like jam. Yeah. I just want it's, everybody out there to know that I did tell him to stop before this happened <laughs> twice. Man, this is a lot left. Yeah, there's plenty left. That's good. Wow. All right. So all right. So choose. now, so now, resuming uh, our normally scheduled program. Uh, look at that! You guys barely gave me any. Look at that. Well, Whoa, you, you spilled half the bottle. <laughs> half the bottle's gone. You got punished. All over um, Ben. I mean, I mean, I got most of it, so. Yeah. I mean, the Three color, the color, it, the color looks like a red wine. Yeah, I mean, cheers. that is insane. Cheers. All right. I mean, I think more than one glass is a little sweet anyway, so. Yeah, it is so sweet. You can really, you do mm. get the raspberries. Mm. Oh, that does taste good. Though. I mean. That is. I've had this so many times. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah, if you do, they have a black cherry one that's amazing. Oh, and you do a half that. and half with a chocolate porter. It's chocolate covered cherries. That's what we used to call it. That is You'd have a it fantastic um, idea. Half of this with uh, like a porter or stout, especially if it's a chocolate stout, you can get like chocolate covered oh, whatever. That it's good. pretty. It's pretty legit. That's awesome. So, Teresa, where are you from? Uh, I grew up in Whittier, California. Where is that? Which is basically probably the very east corner of Los Angeles, um, right before it goes into like Orange County area. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm born and raised, well, technically not born there, but raised there. Um, then I moved to like central LA for the past like five years. How old were you when you moved there? Um, 22. And you were going, <laughs> and you were there for what reason? Um, I mean, I just moved more into there just because I was, at that time, I was, well, at that time I was finishing college. I was going to art school. Um, I was also modeling at the time. And just anything photography and art wise mm-hmm. and fashion is all right there. Mm-hmm. Um, so modeling, did that lead into okay, so what was first? The the passion for the art and and photography or modeling? Um, I technically started modeling first. Um, probably like a s- eighteen. Not seventeen. Seventeen or eighteen. Um, but it was more like random stuff like hot topic and mm-hmm. you know, all those kind of Were you in like some of those cool magazines like uh, what is it, Cosmo? Oh, uh, no, I wasn't that baller. Um, but I was just going to there just to make some extra money to put myself through school. Uh, I started as pre-veterinary medicine and then realized there's no way I could work at a vet hospital. I was like crying all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I can't do this. So I took uh, photography as an elective and I just fell in love with the process of it. Was it immediate? It was pretty immediate. And I think for me, it was more in the art sense of like, it was a way for me to express myself because mm-hmm. I'm very emotionally shut down as a person. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the only way I couldn't, I was not good at verbalizing. So it was the only, I, it was really nice because I could express my feelings or my thoughts through those motions and also not have to talk to people and tell them about it. The thing about photography is the difference between it could be the same picture. And two different people taking that picture, and one could be better, and one one I'm going to say better. They could be different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's the ultimate proof that we are, in my opinion, we all see the world differently, even if we're right next to looking at the set, the exact same thing. Oh, for sure. And I just love that ideal that two people can pretty much do the same thing and come out with different outcomes because it really is what. Your eye is what you're looking for, um, even your technical background in it. It really all just depends. And also the people perceiving it. Two people can look at a piece of art and get two completely different things mm-hmm. off of it. For me, it's just showing some sort of emotional reaction to it. It's like, for me, I feel like I did something if you get some sort of emotional attachment from. Now, what it is, I don't fucking know. It just depends on what, mm-hmm. you, what, you're, right, yeah. what you see in it. Because a lot of it is a reflection of your own self, I think. So people Weird. looking at different parts of art, a lot of it, I think, is internalized. That's really well put. Well, thank you, sir. <laughs> the the alcohol is starting to kick in. So. Is there a particular type of photography that you're drawn to? Or you, originally you were, and then that's changed over time? Or how did um, that work for you? Well, originally it was all conceptual art. There was no like fashion brands or labels or businesses. It was just having these concepts and making them from nothing. Um, so I really love that idea of just creating something from nothing. 
then after a while, I just started working with others like in the fashion industry. And I just, I love the idea of bringing fashion and art together. Um, and then just helping businesses create that whatever they need for them. And it's always going to be a little bit of my vibe, but that's why they're hiring me because they want my vibe. But it's really like having that idea and helping them bring that across is something kind of cool. Like I didn't appreciate it till later on. Earlier, I was mm-hmm. like, it's all about me. Mm-hmm. It's what I want. Yeah. So when you're pitching a new client, how do you describe your vibe to them? Um, honestly, I don't really describe it so much because normally they've already seen my my book or whatever my portfolio online is. Um, and if they just gravitate towards it because it's it's... I don't know, I guess it's hard. I don't know how I would exactly describe it because I do have a very kind of editorial feel to it, even with even with business or health and food and wellness industries. I still have that little bit of that kind of like editorial look or fashion look just because that's just the way I shoot. I think also from being in California, everything's really crisp and clean and bright colors because there's not suns out constantly. So even when I moved mm. out here, I had to really learn how to change some of my settings because it's a lot more moody out here so i had to like really darken my tones and like w- learn how to work in a different kind of light lighting environment really so you're in modeling and then that kind of you said it led into the photography part so you didn't start doing businesses obviously yeah, but yeah. what did you start doing like the typical like weddings um, I first started uh, doing fashion actually, just oh, because wow. I was I just from being uh. out just from being out there and being in the scene. It's like I met, I got to see what went behind the scenes on a fashion shoots or, or any kind of modeling gig because I was there as a model. But I pay attention to the lights and what they're doing and the placement, and then I'd make connections with the stylists and the wardrobe stylists and the hair and makeup people. So when I first started, it was all just like working with designers and fashion lines and stuff. I mean, a lot of it was. Co- like um, collaboration stuff um but that that is more where i started i didn't actually really get into weddings till probably f- a year before i moved out here oh wow and it was more of like just how do i make money at this because <laughs> mm-hmm. i i really enjoyed it but it's like i wasn't sure how to like make money at, at doing what i love and also me being in control of it because i worked with some photo houses and i just it wasn't my vibe i didn't wasn't into it i was like i want to be in control I get it. But then how to make money at that is such a saturated industry. I was going to say. It was like, I was like, how do I do this? Um, and I did really, I and I still do weddings and stuff and boudoir, and I do love it. I love that. What's boudoir? Uh, it's like little sexy pictures. Ah. Your lady right. will take for you. Well, not you. Yeah, that would be brutal. Yeah. That would, you need a lot of photoshopping <laughs> if you did me like that. I'm just saying. <laughs> I want a business over beer boudoir. <laughs> like the like the the. Uh, I can make the that happen. on the couch. That's it, that's exactly that's exactly what she's talking about. Okay, now yes, let's do that. I'm in. <laughs> so, uh, how long have you been in Portland, Vancouver area? I moved out here. I'd say about three years ago. Um, so still fairly recent. Yeah, still pretty recent. My fiance got a job opportunity and. I grew up in Los Angeles my whole life, so I was like, let's do it. Like, yeah. why not? Yeah. And it was to help me be able to st- kind of start my own business just because I was in Los Angeles working at a bar five to six nights a week, just paying my bills. There's no extra time, um, not much sleep. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, to really have that happen, I needed to work less at a bar, and the only way I could do that is have somewhere where my bills weren't so high. No. So, there must have been some sort of a culture shock, though, right? Um, or was it not not really? Eh, not too bad. I was a lot of, a lot of white people. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm mixed, so I can't really, you know, I'm part white, so it's not that. But it was just it was just different, because I grew up in an area, especially Whittier, is mainly Hispanic, and oh, okay. and just growing up in such like a multicultural multi- melting pot. Um that was like a little bit, and I didn't really realize it till I went back home just to visit my parents, and I went to the gym, and then I looked around, and everyone was brown, and I was like, "Oh crap, I live in a really white place." Now. <laughs> right, <laughs> and and like it's probably because of the lack of sun. Yes, but I I enjoy the the transition into fall. I'm really enjoying I it love now. Fall. I hated cold before, and now it's like it's nice. It's like your soul needs that transition. When you're just stagnant the whole year, it, it makes you feel nuts. Especially being in a city, it's like 
You already feel crazy enough. So what's the, besides the weather, obviously, what's the biggest difference between where you grew up and where you are right now? Um, I would say just the nature that's around me, which is also a reason why we moved out here. It's like even driving down on the freeway, even when it's traffic, you still look out and see like this gorgeous nature scene. And it definitely melts away that anxiety. Mm. Um, even when I first moved here, it took me a couple months to really like kind of shed that energy from living in a larger city it's just a little overwhelming after a while and you don't realize it until you're out of it i didn't realize like i was always like you know you're always on the go and and i'm still like that now but it's just a little bit nicer Mm -hmm. i guess you just there's more oxygen maybe (laughs) oh it's funny the contrast listening to her say how coming up here she feels better whereas we have people here who have seasonal anxiety or whatever seasonal depression Mm -hmm. and they want to get the hell out of here yeah whereas people from california are wanting to come up here and you know enjoy the nature you're right canope it's just kind of yeah kind of odd so what was what was the first thing you remember taking a picture of um (laughs) some of my first photos were more just like random sceneries um, some of them were like my, my cousins, my little cousins when they were kids, cause my uncle let me use his, cause I learned on film camera. So for school you had to get a film camera and my uncle let me use his film camera. So it was mostly just taking pictures of my family. Cause for me, I was very much in transitional stages with who I was and like a lot of like my religious beliefs. So there was a lot of like juxtaposition of different things with like religion and spirituality for me. Are you like, Catholic? I grew up Catholic. Yeah. yeah. Both sides are hardcore. Well, my dad doesn't really give a shit about going to church. <laughs> uh, my grandma on his side was very, very Catholic. And then my grandparents are like Polish and Ukrainian and oh, Irish. Wow, really? So wow. just, you know, growing up Catholic, you just got to fear things. And, yeah. and it was a lot of like, you're going to go to hell or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and they'd always get mad because I'd always be questioning. I'd be like, well, what about this? And what about this? And uh, when I got to the little later years, I've kind of fell away from religion. And then the older I got, it kind of came back in. Really? I know. And I feel it's like a little cycle because you go through that cycle of questioning life and everything. And then you get older and you just realize it's all cyclical. And you can believe in whatever religion, but it's all the same message of a higher power. I feel Mm -hmm. is really what it is. Just Catholicism is what I was my opening to it. So I still very much love Catholicism and like attached to it to a degree. Mm hmm. I mean, I feel there's also some crazy, probably satanic worships that go down below and <laughs> in the Pope's dun- oh dungeon, God. which I'm down for. So, I'm uh, just going to stand back for the lightning. I'm just going to stand here behind the curtain yeah, and watch gonna... you guys for a little yeah. while. <laughs> no, dear no, dear ignore me. <laughs> I promise to edit that part out <laughs> for all of our souls. <laughs> uh, well, so every episode... Teresa, Mm -mm. my lovely wife, Angela, whom you know, she brings in a beer. It's a mystery beer. Now, we're going to do things a little bit differently this time, right? We're not going to spray it everywhere? We're not going (laughs) to. Jonathan, we are not going to. We are not going to explode it. We are not going to spray it. To start, we're not going to explode it. But what we used to just open it and see, oh, it's. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. What we're we're going to try do, something new we're today. We're going to guess it. This is going to be, yes, we're going to try to guess. Okay. Right. Do you want to open it? Um, should I? I won't. Well, you're the bartender, should aren't I, you? I yeah, hopefully it, it doesn't first? have a cork. I, I would. Yeah. That's the way I open the beers generally. I don't cheat. All right. So, let's see here. Ooh, thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. Prost. 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 So, it's a lovely golden... Ale. It's obviously an IPA. Um, I think yeah. it's very much an IPA. I think it's probably a double IPA. The malt Got a good on one. the on the nose is really heavy. I know because when I drink it, I'm more thirsty after. That's yeah. how I know yeah. that IPA. It has a little bit of a peach smell though, almost. Oh, you smell peaches. I smell peaches. Yeah. Like smell, smell them peaches. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Sorry. <laughs> so, I'm not so sure exactly what that means, but it's a double IPA. Let's let's, let's Oh, it's got to be in bag. A, Yeah. Alpha. Oh my. Alpha Centauri. Oh. From Hop Valley Hop Valley Brewing out of Eugene. Oh. Have you guys been there? I have, I have not. There's two of them. You want to go to the older one, the original. All right. The new one is cool, but it's more modern. The older one is like in a 
It's in a garage. Mm-hmm. But my goodness, the beers they have at that place, whew, it's phenomenal. They're a great brewer. They're a great, great brewer. They're partially owned by AB InBev, aren't they? Or is it Miller? Miller. I think they're partially owned by Miller Coors. Yeah. But their beers, I've always really liked their beers. And Angie, uh, Teresa, obviously knew you were coming. Uh, I'm just going to read the label here real quickly. Contains alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> she, it was for me, I know. So, pretty good. 100 IBU, 9% ABV. All right. So that's, that's a very it makes up for powerful that beer. 2%. <laughs> I mean, with all of it this spilled, did we actually get 2% of that one? No, we just split it up between us. Kano, what do you think of the <laughs> Alpha Centauri? Uh, it's all right. Uh, I, yeah, I'm not a big fan of it, but I wouldn't drink a lot of it, but it, it tastes all right. I, you, know, you know how I am. I like the lighter beers, but it has a good taste. Um, like Teresa said, I can smell peaches in it, too. Yeah. No. Oh. See, for me, the earthiness, the pininess comes through. Yeah. It, I'm having a hard time, time getting through the malt. Um, it's, it's heavy. It it's is very heavy. heavy. It is a heavy. I, li- um, I, but I it's am good. a fan. I don't. I'm usually a. Um, I'm like you. I get drinking IPAs. I get thirstier. <clears throat> These though, I get like that. That I don't know. Like when you drink a lot of milk, you get that. <laughs> it's like phlegmy. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Just kind of sits on the yeah. back of your tongue for a but while. But it's the malt. Yeah, it's the malt. Just makes me like grind my teeth. Do you like it? Um, I'm honestly not a big fan of IPAs. Um, well, I'll drink yours. Don't oh, I'm worry. I'm still going to drink it. <laughs> At least Back you, off. Hey, we're going to have a fight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. she kicked. Speaking of that, I want to talk about that. Uh-oh. Are you a lethal weapon? I'm not. You hesitated. <laughs> you hesitated. I am not a lethal weapon. I don't. I mean, if something happened on the street, I don't know. I've never been tested. Can but, I? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> could, could you test her, please? Uh, I have to Good get news. consent before I Good news, <laughs> Teresa. get my you ass You have kicked. your first test right here. <laughs> uh, no, but... but so... Did you talk to my wife about this first? You must have. <laughs> yeah. She well, said, yeah, know. let him get his ass kicked. <laughs> you pissed her off. She I must she, have done something. She signed the consent on your behalf. Yeah, she <laughs> totally did. So, uh, what... What... Uh, what do you know? Like, what disciplines do you know? Um, I grew up... My dad teaches martial arts. Uh, so I had to do it. There was no choice. Um, I grew up doing Lima Lama, which is a mix of Aikido, Kempo, Jiu Jitsu, boxing, kickboxing. It's more like a self defense kind of grappling art a little bit. I would say in between like very traditional like karate and like MMA. It's like in the middle there. Mm, okay. And it's more of like self defense art. Um, but they have the whole gambit of it. Um, so yeah, I started that probably when I was like five. Wow. And then I probably stopped training when I was like 21. Um, I mean, my dad said I had to, I had to stay in it until I got my black belt and then I got my second degree black belt. And then I was like, I can't, I don't do this anymore. I love it. I really appreciated it, but it was just, you know, when you're 21, I don't want to be doing martial arts with my dad. I want to be out. Why town, not? You know? <laughs> I did it my whole life. It's like, I loved it. But after a certain point, it's like, I want to do something different. I get it though. Sorry, Dad. I'm gonna go out and drink some beer. Yeah, yeah, right. Sorry, Dad. I'm gonna, go be, a, I'm gonna go be a loser. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So there's, there was that part. <laughs> I mean, that's the only other way I could describe it. Sorry, Dad. I'm gonna go be a loser. <laughs> um, but hashtag I'm, be a loser. Yeah. Hashtag be a loser. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So I stopped doing it, and then you know. Just life as it goes, just got real busy and the only, and especially working at bars, all the classes were on the weekend, were in the weekdays, were at night, or it was like Saturday morning, which after working at a bar Friday night, I'm not going to go work out Saturday morning. Um, so I kind of stopped doing it. And when I visit, you know, he has me go to class here and there. And do you know a lot of it? I mean, do you gets still get a hit in on me if you can? Do you still know a lot of it? Yeah, I think a lot of it's like muscle memory. When you start like getting into it, you kind of remember a lot of it. Um, and those were just like forms and like, you know, all those kind of like learning techniques and all that kind of stuff and movements. So that stuff kind of comes back the more I do it. A lot of other stuff is just natural reaction of just like, I don't know, just basic things. Like someone comes up to you, like I'll be like, I don't know. I'm always like ready. <laughs> it's just like a natural reaction. Right on, look at her. So, She's looking at me like, hey, here's a beer. Oh my yeah. goodness. I'm way over here, sister. Okay. 
<laughs> well, it was just a thing. My dad really taught me to always like kind of be prepared. So it's like if I was yeah. walking down the street, I'm always looking at my surroundings. If before I go out of the building, I make sure I have my mace in my hand. I got to know what's going on before I go out there. So See, just basic like taking care of yourself. Things that people don't do that really should. Yeah, and not so much of like going around just like fighting people or some shit. Yeah, if that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, because the whole point is not to fight, right? Yeah. And a lot of what he taught was just to get out of the situation. So get out of the bad situation and then run off. It's not about like, you gotta fight. Especially if it's like, I mean, it's a larger male that's trying to hurt me. I'm not gonna sit there and be like, let's go for it, buddy. <laughs> to I'm the like, death. No. Yeah, to the death. <laughs> I'm gonna punch him in the throat and I'm gonna run off. Yeah. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> So is that is that spray mace or is that like a swinging mace? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Because I'm picturing walk mace. outside. I know. I know. Pull it out of the purse. Like, <laughs> like like the uh, like the jail guard. <laughs> Come on, boys. I would, I'm here. I'm looking for a fight. <laughs> <laughs> I just strolled down the street with my billy club. Very natural though. Just whistling. Yeah, totally natural. <laughs> Pointed at people, you. Yeah, you're you, next. Yeah, you get your ass kicked you. tonight, or is your buddy over there? <laughs> you eyeballing me, son? <laughs> the handle on my chair is sticky, Ben. Yeah, weird. I what? wonder how that happened. Jesus know. Christ, it's everywhere. <laughs> what? Uh, I mean, it looks. I mean, it looks like a freaking. It looks like a crime scene over here. It's, it's uh, side. So what the? I could see. Me, what the hell happened last night? <laughs> this might be a good reason for us to get new chairs though hey there you go it's an opportunity you're welcome yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's an opportunity. this is for you <clears throat> um i always think about photography like sales and what i mean by that is it's something that everybody thinks they can do so i'm curious <laughs> as a professional photographer so what what is it about what separates a professional photographer from some Joe Schmo like me with my iPhone? Um, I think a lot of it is really just, I mean, obviously the knowledge that you gain from working with people and businesses over a long term, especially with all the new technology. I mean, when iPhone came out with their new phone, I was like, fuck, I'm out of a job. Like, this shit is good. <laughs> and I just have to click one button. Um, but a lot of it is more dealing with the actual people, um, how to navigate that, how to bring the full story to make sense, especially if you're doing branding and stuff like that, it has to be cohesive through all elements. So a lot of it is having the strategy behind it and really being able to draw that out of people because sometimes you're taking portraits of people or even if it is their products and they don't know what they want or how they want it, it's really drawing out that information and making it a reality. Because I feel even with my own stuff, it's hard for me to navigate my own stuff because when you're really close to it, it's a little overwhelming. And you're like, I want this, you want it all. And you have to realize you really do have to cut it down to what's important for what message you're trying to say. Um, and I guess that can go across all gambits of business. But for photo-wise, it really is just knowing those small technical skills that you just learn over a period of time of just knowing your angles and knowing how to work with people and knowing how to, how to angle things properly. And just manipulating light is the basic thing. Because if you can't manipulate light properly, it just doesn't work. Um, even on your iPhone that kind of does it all. It still can only do so much. Definitely. How do you get in front of the right decision makers at these companies and pitch them the value of of photography versus manipulating stock photos and Photoshop and you know falsely putting their products into into pictures? Because you can obviously do an awful lot with that, and I you know and do it very economically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you how do you show the value of of what you do to those decision makers when you're when you're inside these businesses? Um, I think a lot of it is just having them have a real understanding of marketing, really. Um, I mean, photography is just a part of marketing, but if they're not really willing to put the time or the energy into their marketing because it grows their business, it kind of just it just doesn't work because you you can help them to a certain degree, but there's certain people that just don't see the value in that and. Even as like small mom and pop shops, I feel like probably like the hardest to show them the value of that because they've been around for a long time. They don't think they need it. But now, especially transition to everything's online, everything's digital. It's like you, ha you have to. You have to have some sort of element to show what you're actually selling or what it actually is. Because if I, I mean, I just go up my personal look. If I look at something online and I can tell it's stock images, more likely I won't go there. 
just because I want something that's authentic. I want to know that this is what I'm getting. Um, unfortunately, everything's a give me now kind of stage. So you do have to give them that, you know, if I'm looking online and I see something that doesn't look like how it is in person, or if it's just an unappealing photo, which I have a lot of times, especially for food places, you go online, you see just this plate that looks gross. It's like, why am I going to eat there? I know it probably is really good, but I'm going to make a snap judgment and say that you're not there yet. Um, or any other kind of business. If I'm seeing stock photos, I see someone that's just not there in their business yet or not quite as successful as I feel they could be. When you get to the point and you can make authentic images and authentic marketing to the people that you want, that's when you start growing your business. So for me, it's like if you want to grow your business and elevate, you you have to elevate in all factors. And it has to be a complete like package. You can't mm-hmm. just like redo your website and slap some whatever photos on there. It just, it just doesn't come off the same. Um, and for me, I just speak my truth with them. If they don't agree with me, then they don't agree with me. I, you know, I can't only make them believe so much. But if, for me, if someone wants authentic, be authentic. And that means they want to see your face. They want to know who you are. They want to know your product. And they want to know the people behind it. And I feel that's the most important part is showing yourself as being part of your business. Yeah. Because everything is a little bit more personable now. Yeah. You know what I see all the time now, and just made me, what you were talking about with the food, just made me think of, um, I see continuously these bars putting up shots of food. I mean, hourly it seems. Here's our new dish, come try our new dish. And you can tell it's shot with an iPhone just straight back in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, is there a value proposition there? I mean, the how fast those those pictures need to get out and how how much volume there is there. I would assume it's probably difficult to hire a professional photographer for that sort of application. But but my goodness, how how important could that be for a small tap room? That's a great question. That bro. sells food. <clears throat> great question. How I mean, they could benefit from from you even even thirty minutes on site taking a picture of their new dish and then getting it out on social it seems to me there there's a there's a a business proposition there have you ever explored that at all um yeah definitely with businesses i mean there's a bar that i do it for now and it's basically a constant creation of content for them just because seasonally every season they have a new food and drink menu so every season we do full new set of photos for that but as well as like their specials there's events constantly and you just need stuff to post like every day almost now i mean if you really want to be active you're mostly posting like almost every day so you need some sort of content and they don't want to see just the food they want to see the people that are there the behind the scenes people who's working there you know i love showing the people that are working while they're working i feel it just gives more of like a a personality to it um as regards to the food i mean you can always do so much on your iphone obviously if you need to get it out that second But in all honesty, if you're some sort of restaurant or anyone that's promoting having food, I mean, you should be anything just like marketing. You know, you don't just market and have an event tomorrow and start marketing the day before. You usually have like a plan of like at least a few months beforehand Mm -hmm. of preparation to properly get something out. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (sighs) You'd like to think that. Yes, (laughs) Yes, for sure. It definitely doesn't happen (laughs) for sure. Um, and you know, if they need to get it out and they want to use their iPhone, fine. But I mean, that's on them. It's like, if your dish doesn't look appetizing, for me, there's no, it's better to have no photo than having an up, an appetizing photo well, um, out there. I agree. 100%. I, I agree 100%. Yeah. So a while back we spoke and you were putting together a blog where you highlight other businesses. Are you still doing that? I still do that. Um, it was actually on my wedding website, which now I'm redoing my commercial website, so it's kind of transferring over, but I'm basically setting everything up for next year. Um, so I, I like to highlight. I mean, I definitely do stuff on like photo photo shoots I have or behind the scenes. I like to show that kind of stuff. But my favorite is just kind of share other people and their businesses and really showing the personal side behind it. It's like no matter what the business is, there's people that run it, even if you're the owner or maybe you're just the manager or whatever. It's like there's people there. So I like to see and hear from their perspective of why they started their business, where they're coming from, what they do. And then I always like to have them share a little information just for others that are on the same path. 
Because for me, when I first started, like, free information was just it. Like, I just Googled the crap out of everything until you started learning stuff. And then you start meeting people and you learn more. And, I mean, just sharing the knowledge is really how you learn. Because we, I mean, let's get real. None of us know what the fuck we're doing. (laughs) Oh, yeah. We're just kind of going as it as it happens and changing right. what doesn't work and what works and hoping for the best. <laughs> yeah. We were just we were just talking about that with this podcast, right? I mean, how much research can you do? How many Facebook groups can you be a part of? How much yeah. can you read? And all of that is helpful and all of that is great. Um, but you're not going to learn it until you do it. Yeah, you yep. just And you just kind of got to jump in and make mistakes mm-hmm. and figure it out as you go and just kind of try to keep getting better. Yeah. I What's think that's the, a lot of the fear. That was my first, like, always the fear of, like, oh, my God, I'm never, yeah. I'm, I'm never going to know. Or I don't know. I'm not good enough or whatever. But, I mean, you should never really be good enough because you don't, should always be striving to do better regardless. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if that's the Catholic in me <laughs> saying you're not good enough. <laughs> Uh, but, oh, I mean, boy. you should always strive to be better and learn more. But there is a point where you, I just really had to be like, well, I'm just going to do it. And anything that kind of made me nervous, I just started doing. Because if I got scared, I was like, I need to do it. Because it's obviously something that frightens me. And it's something that I need to know how to do. And good luck. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> so when you sit down with a business, with the story, you're helping to create their story. What? What do they? What do you ask? Like, what questions are you asking your businesses? Um, and what do they have to know before they come and visit you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, which I kind of had to learn in the process, because once I start going, I'll just be like vomit words all over the place, and I had to really stop and listen to what they needed. And it really was. It's like, what? What are you wanting out of this? What are your goals? Like, where are you looking to take this? Because if I don't know where they want to go with it. It doesn't matter what I'm making because if I'm concocting some plan, that's not going to get them in the trajectory they want. There's no point. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it is just saying what they want, what they need. Um, so I, I get it. So what if – what? If, okay, I'm a business owner and I say, hey, Teresa, hey, I want to – I want you to tell my story in through the visuals that you create. Okay, what's the first question you're going to ask me? Um, my first question would probably be more of like, what are the core values of your business? Like, what do you value most? Not just in your business, but for you as a person too, because that should translate over your business. Um, so if you're really fascinated and connected with the community and you, you really want to build that network within your business or one of your core values is to be able to give lower pricing to people that normally couldn't afford something like that, but still make a profit. It's like, we have to have a strategy of how you could still make a profit but give these things to the mm-hmm. community. Um, so a lot of them is just the values of what do they value as a person and as business. So those things translate to where the story needs to go. I love that. And, and for a couple of reasons. One, it gives you an idea of exactly where you're going to take them, right? And, I mean, there's all their weight. But the second <laughs> is it's going to make me as a business owner think, like, whoa, I don't know my values, man. Which right? is hard. Most right. people don't. Yeah. It's like, and that comes with the part where you have to kind of draw things out. Like, I've worked with many people that, like, I worked with a bridal, a wedding dress designer, and it was really showing up. I was like, well, what are you feeling? Like, what is the look? What are you wanting? And she was like, I don't know. Mm-hmm. She didn't, she didn't know. So it was just slowly, like, keep asking her almost the same questions, but in different variations to finally get out what she wanted. So let's say I get all that. I have, I have my values. I know. Is it more of a one-on-one? What what would be the next step? Uh, I mean, normally the initial meeting is whoever's spearheading it. Um, if it's the owner or if it's they gave that to someone else to spearhead the whole project, that's normally the person that I'll be talking to. More of one-on-one. Um, once we get down their needs and their wants and all that stuff, then, then I would bring other team members in, depending on what they want. So if it's just like all they need is... Like photos or something, it's like I can handle that and it'll be a more of a one-on-one basis. Mm. Um, there might be things where they need more strategy or other things and I'll bring in other people to help configure the whole story. So it is cohesive throughout everything. Um, so it really just depends on what, what you're looking for. I mean, I really like working with people on an individual basis. Um, large groups are a little overwhelming to me mm-hmm, anyway. Mm-hmm. But I feel most of it, it's like I want to work directly with the people who are spearheading it. Because when you get all the other chatter in there, it just becomes too chaotic. I agree. So what does success look like for Nunez Photography in the next two years? Um, well, I just started working with a creative agency. 
So two years I'm hoping to, I mean, I still work at a bar on the weekend. So by next year, my goal is to be out of the bar. What does that mean you're working with a creative agency? Uh, so I basically work with an agency that does the whole gamut of full marketing services. And I'll be working with them as doing the photography. And then eventually sh- I'll be starting to take on creative direction and other entities of that. Because I also do like social media posting and stuff like that. It's not stuff. My, f- for, my foremost thing is photography. And that's what I really want to be doing. But I also really love the idea of. I love the conceptualizing of it, and I love putting it all together and the creative direction of it. So working with this is just working with the team to have that whole story fit together. Um, so working with them would just increase the amount of business that would come to me because she's outsourcing photography to me. Um, so by two by two years, I hope to have, like, because her goal is to have a brick and mortar. So by two years, we hope to have, like, a brick and mortar that has a su- substantial influx of businesses coming through um hopefully in five years maybe have my own but for me it's just kind of i'm just going with it now like i've just started i've stopped i'm very controlling so i stopped trying to control everything it doesn't fucking work you can never control it so i'm just taking the good things that come in and as long as i keep moving forward that's all that matters to me because if i stop i'm screwed so even if like right now is the time where you know i start to get burnt out by the end of the year i just as long as i'm still moving forward working towards that common goal of really just wanting to better myself and just better my position from for my business and be able to take the jobs that i want and not take the jobs that i don't want and uh, eventually i like to be able to have more time where i can financially afford to have time for myself sure. aside and then really just full time be being able to do photography and create concepts so i hate to, t- to turn on a serious note here so it's important though that that i ask this question because um you know we take our the bios that you fill out very seriously and we want to do our prep work as serious interviewers so um i'd like to know what is it about brunch that you like so much <laughs> yeah. where's the best brunch in the portland metro area and what's your favorite <laughs> brunch, brunch dish <laughs> I'm like, did I put brunch down? Sounds like something art I do. Art plus brunch. Oh, art and brunch. Art and if brunch. If you combine that, that'd yeah. be cool. Um, honestly, I just don't wake up early enough to have regular breakfast. <laughs> yeah. um, awesome. That's a great answer. That yeah. totally is. So <laughs> brunch is it. And it's that perfect combination where it's like you can have a mimosa and you don't feel as judged. Because when it's like 9 in the morning, you're some sort of a problem. But <laughs> if it's like a little later at 11, it's all right. It's brunch. It's fine. You're having pancakes. It's cool, you know. Ben? Oh. It's that, time. It's that time. It's that time for the final question. Final question. Teresa. Yes. You have a one-way ticket to anywhere in the world, first class, by land, sea, air. Anywhere in the world. Where are you going to go and why? I have always wanted to go to Peru. And I just love anything with ancient artifacts like i'm obsessed i mean i've peru egypt anything where there's just that ancient history i am fascinated by and just that energy while you're there it's just there's something you can feel there that's just something natural to the world order almost Mm -hmm. different time i don't know i'm fascinated by history so i'd love to go see like the the aztec and mayan like machu picchu there you go that's what it is Nice. Um, yeah, I think that'd be amazing. Something to go there and just see that part of the world and the history that goes with it. Uh, Teresa, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you really, for having me. Really enjoyed this conversation. If people want to find out more about Teresa Nunez and Nunez Photography, where's the best place to find you? Uh, my website, uh, Nunez Photography.com. Jonathan, where can they find Business Over Beer? Uh, BizOverBeer.com. That's B I Z Over Beer. Of course, Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, biz over beer. Uh, please uh, continue to support our podcast. Uh, you can find us now on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Podbean, TuneIn Radio, uh, Pocket Casts. We're all over the place. YouTube. 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 Please subscribe. Please. We're so thankful for the support of all of our listeners thus far. Um, if your favorite platform, uh, you don't see us on your favorite platform, please let us know and we will make sure to get it up there. So, uh, we really appreciate everybody listening. Thank you again, Teresa, for joining us. Canope, you want to be a guest on the show? Got to let us know. Canope, K-N-O-P-P, at bizoverbeer.com. Boom. Boom. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Teresa, thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. All right. We'll You're talk so to you. You're so welcome.
Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we're out. <laughs> See you next week. See ya. It was that last one. Like, and where did the thing go? Where did the... It went shot all the way over here. It's underneath here. Oh, there it is. We're going to yeah, just... do some cleaning. Okay, yeah, I'm just trying to avoid all the sprayed <laughs> francois. I'm sorry about the spray. <laughs> you open I also had to bring the most the reddest, sun. most stain-worthy drink. And, and, and none it's of you, going away, though, isn't and it? None, and none it's of you bastards away. even said, hey, thanks. <laughs> you guys would have stared at that, at that cork for, like, an hour. Well, maybe we should go down to 7-Eleven and buy the dollar thing. I don't know. What do you guys want to do? Let's go get some I, Mad I, Dog. I, I, ma- I, yeah, I, I made it happen. Yes. Thanks for spilling half the beer. There <laughs> <You're welcome>. <laughs> for, Thank you for the recognition. <laughs> Business Over Beer reminds you to always drink responsibly. Our theme song is Idiocracy by Christian Leo. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Business Over Beer.